Bob Claybrook is the practice lead for hybrid IT, along with Jason Jolly. He is an ex executive here at MicroStrategies. We have now been joined by Daniel Tumpkin. Um, he is an integration and development technical sales leader for IBM. So welcome to the conversation, Daniel. Hi. Thank you. Hello, right. Daniel. How are you doing? Good, good. Glad to be here. Everybody's been having a great day. Excellent. So so we just we just finished up with Sean. I'm sure you listened to part or all of it. Yeah. Um, just to make sure we're in the sync and, and I've heard the sessions earlier today. So we, we've talked about the cloud packs overview. We're you know we drilled into applications. Now we're going to talk about integration. So why don't you just take a second? I don't know if you heard Sean's opening there, but uh, take it. I don't know if you have a slide you want to go through, but take us through what the integrations cloud pack is because you know this is the portion where our applications and we start to talk about integration we mentioned a few things you know service mesh and we talked about mq a little bit and some of those pieces but let's let's set the context for us and then jason and i'll come back with a couple of questions and we can start the conversation and roll through it if that makes let's, sense um yeah i'm trying to show my screen oh here we go me a moment. Um, Changing from video conference platforms on a regular basis is always fun. <laughs> yeah, and then, and then the, uh, the Mac asks me, okay, you know, all the all the permissions. Are you okay with uh, the screen getting recorded? So hopefully you can you can see my screen. Yes, we can. Yeah, all right, Good. perfect. All right. So and and uh, I encourage you, anybody, if if you'd like to to reach out to me, uh, either email or LinkedIn, I'm I'm more than happy to to have uh, additional conversations outside the, the scope of this tight 30 minutes that we've got. But I mean, this, this yep. is a great opportunity. And just uh, while, while I'm switching over, the uh, so I have a little over 15 years of integration background, doing enterprise application integration, business to business integration, uh, middleware and private cloud, uh, both inside and outside of IBM. So uh, just a little on myself. So if we look at just kind of jumping right to Cloud Pack for integration. So, you know, Sean was saying, you know, Cloud Pack for application release focus on you know, bringing a unified application development layer uh, for and tooling for you know, making it easier to um, modernize your um, application landscape. Cloudpack for Integrations looking at doing the same similar thing by taking our best of breed standard offerings uh, that we have. So MQ, MQ Advance, um, App Connect Enterprise, which some of you might know as IBM Integration Bus, or even going back further, WebShare Message Broker. Uh, IBM's uh, API Connect, which is our leading uh, API management platform, Data Power, uh, Spare for uh, data transfer and data streaming, and of course, uh, IBM Event Streams, which is our enterprise implementation of Kafka. So bringing all of these different standalone offerings together and unifying them under a single user experience, a single control plane, allowing us to provide a way of delivering integrations and all the different capabilities that you might have been doing with separate teams under you know a unified experience but at the same time bringing financial benefits around uh you know making uh it easier to license all these different capabilities and easier to uh, change which components i'm leveraging at different points in time um but you know as we've kind of highlighted today it's bringing everything onto that full stack of Red Hat OpenShift. And you know, as um, I can't remember if it was, um, if it was Bob or Jason kind of just alluded to it a few moments ago on you know really looking at Red Hat OpenShift as that common operating system model. So that way, you know, we have that unified experience regardless of the platform of infrastructure that we're choosing. Uh, so that way we can spend more time focusing on delivering higher level business results to customers and less time going, all right, how do we actually deploy this, this technology into any given infrastructure? How do we operationalize it? How do we secure it? How do we uh, scale it? And, and really leveraging Red Hat OpenShift is that common layer for doing so that allows us to provide that decoupling between the integration layer, you know, the, the technology suite, and the infrastructure layer. And it, I look at a lot of just the same way that you know you leverage integration technology to decouple your different disparate business applications, uh, your different disparate services, so that you don't create that tight coupling. So you have that flexibility uh, to modify your solutions over time. Uh, and you know, and a big part of the driver, you know, that you know, we really see as an uptick in the need for integration is that you know over you know from 2018 to you know projecting out to about 2023 this is again idc this is an ibm saying this 
it's you know there's going to be 500 million new applications that are going to be created and you know these applications are going to be you know being delivered out there to provide new business services uh, for customers, and you know you're going to be putting these things into to your environment to to deliver something. So it's going to be an investment that you're making. But at some point, you're going to want to be able to not only when you're building that application from the start, tap into other systems of record and other SaaS providers and other technologies and tooling. But exactly. in the future, in the future, you're going to want to be able to tap into these applications. And so making sure that you have this robust ecosystem to deal with it, because you know. You know, these applications aren't necessarily going to be going away. Uh, the majority of the applications, I believe it's over 90% of the applications, are going to be around for four plus years. And again, you know, it's it's that technical investment and business investment you've made in the application. You want to see getting more and more, you know, out of it. So, you know, anything that you've put in, and you know, I, I, you know, and I hear the term legacy, uh, you know, legacy applications. I always look at it as if you deployed it to production yesterday. Today, it's a legacy application. It's something that you have out there that you're supporting. Now, even if it's in an agile model where you're looking at updating it and refactoring and, and improving it, the version that you put out into production is legacy. And you might not know when the business is going to say, hey, we're no longer going to make improvement investments in this application. We're, you know, it's just going to sit out there and do its job for whatever that long tail is. So how can we best tap into these uh, applications that aren't necessarily going to always get modernized, as well as bridge them into the new applications that are you know, being born on cloud or being moved from you know, traditional monoliths into microservices and you know, really providing uh, an ecosystem fabric for doing so. So you know, again, this, this is just driving that use case for integration. Hey, um, Daniel, and, Daniel, yeah, once, exactly. yeah, I was going to say just a quick question. Someone once told me that, uh, you know, building applications today or building services and solutions is kind of like, you know, planning a city or planning an area. So. <laughs> I, I think I, I might have said that. Uh, yeah, so <laughs> you, yeah, it, I look at it as, an, and, and, you know, this is a conversation we were having during some of the, the early meetings of, of you know, if you're building applications, and I, I've always come from the integration side of the world. I, I've, I've worked in application development, but, but for the most part, I, I really loved integration. Uh, when you're building applications, to me, it's a lot like, you know, um, being a, a, a Getty or a Frank Lloyd Wright, or an, you're an architect. You're building this bespoke structure that's focusing on solving a specific set of finite problems. And that's great. We need those types of, of applications and services to provide those point pieces uh, for our business. But I look at integration as being, you know, that urban planner. I need to think about how is this, this building going to sit in the construct of my, my city, my ecosystem for today, as well as in the next 50 years, if we're talking architecturally. And, and, and you know, when I look at, you know, that 50 year model from a technology standpoint, that's, that's anywhere from six months to three years, you know, it's, you know, cause we have a, that collapsed timeline where we're constantly building and destroying. But it's going to reside out there, and it's going to need to deal with what happens when the city expands. What happens when we go from needing to support uh, 100,000 people to you know a million people? And urban planners are all about that. You know that you know thinking about the the whole ecosystem, not just the one building. Um, and I really do think that integration, and you know, and you know, you know, Gartner uh, kind of backs us up in you know saying you know where's the majority of the work being spent from uh, creating new digital applications is in the integration space. So, you know, it, we should be thinking about doing integration in a different way than we do application development. You know, if we're writing a ton of code to, to tie our different applications together, we're probably not gonna be building a ecosystem that's gonna be highly flexible and highly robust. Um, and again, we're, we're tying together a lot of things. Even if you're saying, no, I've, I've got my, my application stack, you're going to have SaaS components. You're most likely going to be already or wanting to tie into AI, and you're not going to put machine learning models into every single application. Um, right. Same with things like you know, decoupling out your business automation. So you know, we could go through this list, um, and of course, microservices, you know, you know, being a, a wonderful use case for integration. I, I don't want to have my microservices, my micro applications, knowing all the complexities about everything around them. Um, I want to I want to have them, you know, very cleanly decoupled, 
And yes, that kind of does lean us back to, I want some smarter pipes. I don't want it to be a, a full dumb pipe model because if it's a full dumb pipe model, I've got to put that integration logic somewhere. And usually that means a software developer is writing it into thousands or tens of thousands of lines of code, which has to be maintained and has to really, be yeah. uh, you know, I really like I, I really like the, the uh, urban planner analogy. That's why I called it out. <laughs> yeah. Ditto. Yeah. It's, whatever, it's great. whatever I install today is legacy tomorrow. That that's that's yeah. perfect. And I think the one thing we, we're sitting here talking about cloud technologies and cloud, and you said it several times, you're saying it perfectly. You know, an integration strategy from a technology perspective is probably the most important piece you're going to go after because at the end of the day, you're going to be talking to multiple clouds, right? You, you, you mentioned SaaS, but if there's a purpose-built SaaS solution that works for your business, you just want to make sure you understand what that solution is and how I'm going to be able to integrate it and what that SaaS solution's capabilities are and how it fits into your framework. And I think when you pull it back to the, the conversation today, more specifically about cloud packs, how we can integrate with the, the cloud pack for integration, it's significant because we're talking about going back to, I'll, I'll go with legacy again, we've said historical, made different references, pulling all those forward, as well as building cloud native. We know how to build a modern application today, but we also know, as you said, that's gonna change next week, next month, whatever. You know, we're talking, you know, 12 factor cloud native applications right now, it, it could be 24 or 100 next month. So, you know, that, that's just how we continue to evolve. So uh, the integration component, your integration strategy, from my perspective, and Jason touched on it several times with our clients, that is, you know, mission critical from, from that perspective when you're trying to recognize that value. To your, to your earlier point, you know, we're not building buildings that they may not last for 50 years, or maybe they will. I don't know. I mean, some of the applications I've supported have been out there for 50 years, so it seems like. But hey. <laughs> and, and I mean, we still have, you know, large chunks of, let's say, the financial industry working on, you know, mainframe applications that, yeah, they've, they've been around for that 50-year time period, and they still are being leveraged from business-critical workloads, and we need to think about, you know, how can we tap into those? And I mean, that's the extreme case. Uh, but yeah, the, the applications some, that you deployed yesterday. I think it's 90 plus percent of your credit card transactions still touch a mainframe in real time, which to me blows my mind. So very, I don't know what the percentage is today. I'm sure it's changing, but it's a very high percentage because of the banking industry, as you're pointing out. So that, and again, that's, I only say it because that's all integration. Just gives you a, a sense of the magnitude of what we're talking about here. But you know, that, that's a great example. And that, because it applies to the code we write today and that you never know what's going to have to integrate with you later, right? I'm sure that when those guys wrote those systems, however many years ago, they had no idea what was about to, to, to go in 20 years from then, right? Um, right. So, so as much as we try when we build our applications to envision all those integration touch points, et cetera, and we do that for a customer, then we may get a call from next year saying, oh, we just bought this company and now they have to, we have to integrate all these different systems in. Um, and, and that integration ends up becoming the biggest part of the story um, and, and how all those things talk together and get value from each other, uh, which, which is a, a really big deal. And what I often find is uh, most of our application development projects somehow turn into an integration project at some point right. because there, there's so many things that you have to, to touch yeah. on to validate sources, even drop downs come from that source and this source and uh, yeah. And, and integration is hard. I mean, just the number of security token types, the number of wire protocols, the number yeah. of payload formats. And, you know, if we go back to kind of, you know, from a historical sense, you know, we, we should always try to take what we learned in the past. You know, from a SOA standpoint, we tried to canonicalize the model of data, but the realization was that's really hard. That slows down business. Uh, if I have to go to a, a data group to say my in-flight data model has to be part of this enterprise canonicalized system, I can't actually be that agile. Uh, you know, suddenly we're back to more of this waterfall approach of, okay, we'll get it into the next rev of the model and I got to go look at all the application impacts. So, you know, if we, if we really you know, move towards this, this you, know, you know, really decoupled agile approach of, I need to be able to move quick, move fast, describe my data in my way. Well, then I do end up having this integration challenge of, well, different systems need to be able to map the different data sets to each other uh, and, you know, Again, it, it actually you know, expands the, the challenges that we're seeing, but at the same time, you know, IBM's provided a really rich set of tooling to make this a lot simpler so that we're not saying, oh, integration is gonna be 90% uh, of my code base. It's integration is gonna be done through you know, things like drag and drop, no code integration, leveraging smart connectors where we built the intelligence of how to integrate with components together so you can really focus on the business value 
of you know dealing with I have a data model and a different data model, and even putting AI mapping into place of saying let's have IBM suggest based on your you know previous mapping and our experience as well of what data should be mapped to what data and uh, where should that be involved. So really making it so we can speed up the time uh, that you can you know, deliver integration results, which are then again you know speeds up your digital platform projects and improves the likelihood of success. So. Some of the things that we've seen, and I'd be you know, curious, uh, you know, Bob and Jason, on, on your you know, standpoint, but you know, we do break it down into really three core pillars. You know, that it's um, modernizing, you know, changing the way we're doing things around people and process. Um, you know, you know, changing you know, things like you know, moving it from centralized integration teams, and you know, not just from the deployment, but from where the knowledge is about how to do integration, to really pushing it to uh, decentralizing. Uh, you know, into the different uh, squads that you have out there, if you know, you know, or or the different you know, agile, you know, however you're you're grouping your people, you're really looking at empowering those teams. So empowering uh, traditional, let's say, app developers to show them how to leverage integration tooling, so they're not just you know, you know relying on what they know. Um, and and you know, same with architecture. You know, you know having a, a feedback loop on you know, moving towards um, you know, how can we do things more API led or event driven. Um, composite of the both, so leveraging the right tool for the right job, and then doing it in a, in a microarchitecture way with fine-grained deployments. And of course, then having technology that can implement the people process in the architecture, um, you know, to, to you know, to make it so it's successful. So that way, you can have that continuous feedback loop. So, uh, is this you know, are these things that you're seeing uh, with clients that you're working with? Is you know, is this resonating uh, you know, with driving Absolutely. success? Uh, across the board, and I love this slide because it, it does touch on uh, everything here is important. <laughs> and uh, and I love that you mentioned feedback loops because uh, uh, all of this helps drive that that conversation and feedback loops, knowing that what we're doing is successful. Um, so that uh, a, a lot of engagements we'll have, we'll start out doing a solution, and it and we'll deliver exactly what everybody thought we should deliver, and then we we get it out there and we play with it and say, you know what? Maybe we have to tweak this and do this or that, but we have to get to that conversation faster, right? Uh, so that the, the, the customer can use the, the actual solution as quick as possible and then say, I know this is what I asked for, but it actually turns out not to be what I need. Let's pivot it and do it a bit differently to meet those needs. Um, and you don't want to do that over the course of six months, right? <laughs> you you lose a lot. So so um, the closer we can can achieve all of the, these, the people, process, architecture, technology, if we can get the, the the team so that everybody has a voice, everybody's empowered, everybody has a stake in it, right? So it's not uh, just following orders, but um, I'm invested in the success of, of this project. Um, then we'll have the, the people actually implementing and saying, hey, um, this doesn't make sense to me. What about this or that? And, and we can move a bit quicker that way. Um, but but then getting the value of that and what's being built uh, to people to actually see and put their hands on, it, it does require having the right kind of architecture and 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 being able to to like have uh, microservices and things like that. Really, really does help, right? Um, and then when we talk about containers, et cetera. Um, this takes away a lot of the configuration hell that we used to have to deal with, right? <laughs> um, so when, when we do the work and we have the infrastructure's code and it's immutable, unchangeable, we just push it out. Um, we know that whatever we built there and whatever is being played with is going to act the same way as we push it out through the different cycles and get all the way live. Um, and because it's automated and it's quick and we don't have a lot of, we don't have somebody going to a server yet and following a config docs, okay, now step 13, let's do this, <laughs> right? Um, it just gets pushed out. Um, it allows that next cycle to get pushed out with a, with a hit of a button, right? You, you push the button and all of a sudden, everything you've just built, all the value you've just built gets pushed out immediately for whatever cycle that may be that your business is comfortable with. Um, but uh, uh, then you get that that value. And in order to, to get that whole flow to work, you really do need to focus on these areas. I mean, all of these things are, are like the three di different pillars in a way of a stool that you, in order to make that happen uh, quickly and, and show that value quick. I, I agree with Jason. I, I love the chart. And to me, it's um, how do you start that iterative engine, right, of change? As you talked about, how do I get to a point where I'm getting, you, you mentioned the word empower people, to get their input, to get it into the process that you're trying to build, just to increase the value. It, it's it's emotion, it's momentum, right? And then once you build that and get it rolling, whether you know whether you support it, you know, with your internal teams, use some external resources, whatever the case may be, that's the business value that you're driving. That that is the key. And again, 
you know, we, I start on the right here and look at the technology stack that we're using, the decisions that we're making when we're architecting and then bringing the right folks to the table. I don't think you ever stop bringing people into it, right? Based on where yeah. you're going, it's just like a Pac-Man going through the organization and eating everything. <laughs> in room and we're, we're knocking it out. So, I mean, I think once you have that nimbleness, to me, that, that that's key. And it, it all it all starts with integration. First, the network, then integration. But yeah, close, you know. So <laughs> it's, I mean, from a technology stack perspective. So I, right. I, I totally agree with the slide. And, you know, I, I love the thought process that you guys put into it, so. And, and that's, you know, when we look at, you know, IBM as an integration, you know, technology partner, it's, we're not just saying, you know, here's our tools, go figure out how to leverage it. It's really also coming with that thought leadership around saying, here's the tools, here's what we've seen working with hundreds of other customers, and here's how we're also iterating with our own tools to make our tools better to meet your needs. So it's, you know, that continual feedback loop with, you know, where are, you know, what are customers doing, what it's, you know, really successful, what do you need next? And, you know, as part of bringing, you know, the, all the technology into the cloud pack and bringing, you know, so it's easy to say, I have an integration flow that's now exposing an API. Let me go push that API into API Connect to be managed, then be uh, put into a, you know, so it's in a, automatically in, integrated into a portal. So, you know, you know, customers both inside your organization or possibly outside your organization can start consuming those APIs through self-discovery. It's you know, starting to streamline that whole process inside the tooling so then you're not focused on okay, what tool am I using to do what job, but really looking at what is my outcome that I'm really trying to achieve and right. having this tool set out there uh, that delivers that robust outcome. Um, and, you know, and, and you know, part of that, you know, that empowering of people is, you know, by, you know, really, you know, and, and to me, this has been when you know, working with other companies has been one of the, the hardest challenges, but the, the most beneficial in the long run is, you know, when, when I was, you know, outside of IBM working in, in integration, we look like what we were on the left. It was we had an integration team. Uh, a group would you know ask us to do a project work. We'd get a you know an assignment. We'd go build an integration without really the context of the business use case or knowing what was the application developers doing in their code. You know we we were just assigned you know here's what you need to build. And you know what we've done. Need some data points. You pull in, pulling these data points from this place is really yeah, what it comes yeah. down to. Yeah. Right. It was, you know, here's the data we need. Here's the mapping. You know, here's some air handling rules. Go do it. Leave me alone and 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 and, and come back with the, the done product. And then if there's a bug, they open the ticket. And you know, it was, it was a really inefficient process in the regards of understanding what are you really doing to enable the business that's being done. I mean, you were getting the technology out the door really fast because you were a tight team. That's all you really did was integration. But we found that by actually embedding those integration skills in that decentralized model. So getting you know, the, the integration developer onto the individual business projects, that A, the, the integration developers were adding more value because they'd be able to look at what is the business actually building in their componentized architecture and say, oh, what you're doing over here is actually an integration item that you're writing into code. So let's pull that out. You know, oh, you could be using, instead of messaging, maybe you should be using eventing and again, you know, or, or maybe you're using eventing and you're actually causing yourself some more problems where a you know message you know a, you know pseudo sync messaging would actually be more efficient and effective uh, for what you're trying to do or a composite of the both. So bringing that perspective directly into the application teams, um, you know, has been an amazing way of uh, speeding up the ability for integration to be effective in an organization as well as delivering higher value results uh, inside of the projects. And Daniel, think about where that was, you know, three years ago, five years ago, 10 years ago, because you mentioned back with your organizational chart on the left and where it is today. Yeah. Think about the data, you know, the, and Juan Nunez said this earlier this morning, one of the sessions, and I'm sure he's talking about the analytics track, the, the, the decisions in, in the, it's just in time now. And it's not just in time inside of two applications talking to one another. That's a given. It's just in time at the client on the phone when they're in the store or, or they're driving down the road, right? So that's how tightly coupled the integration has to be. And we're just starting to approach from an IoT perspective, right? So as, as devices become smarter, how much more information of the feedback loops are we gonna get? The integration just becomes that much more interesting or opportunistic. I won't say, you know, a problem, I'll say it's an opportunity. But, you know, I mean, that, that going down to the many, many devices that we're gonna have to integrate in real time. And that's, that's why it's important to, the, the, to me, that's the, the chart that we show in front of me where we have that centralized integration team. 
they just don't work anymore. Where tech well, it's, it's volatile. It's volatile because the, those things you're integrating with, I mean, even when you start a dev project and you build it, I mean, uh, there's that API today, but then mm -hmm. tomorrow there's a new API or it's changed slightly. It's got more features. It's got more things, whatever it is. Um, so you have to help uh, insulate your, your projects from that in a way and, and having an integration framework helps with that. But it also goes back to what you said earlier, Daniel, about the idea of the the central messaging that you, you know, when, okay, everybody's going to use this data format to transfer all their data around and, and stuff like that, which used to happen quite a bit. Um, and, yeah. and it's not realistic, right? Um, and, uh, uh, and the more you want to tie into more real world yeah. services uh, uh, that are you know, surfacing everywhere now, right? Um, like every project we do has half, at least half a dozen different integration points. Um, now with a decentralized ownership, it, it does help a lot. I Meaning you, you, right. you don't have the whole, we got to recode our app because the integration changed again thing as much right and 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 you know that that recode the app you know to me it reminds me of you know we used to think about shadow it i, I tend to now think about shadow integration of uh, yeah. where people building right. integrations into things that you really don't know that it's truly integration and then you know to some degree it, it's it's selfish of those teams because you know as you talk about like with iot pulling in lots of data if, if that team's saying oh we're we're pulling in all this data, but we're only doing it for ourselves and and we're gonna you know, build the integrations bespoke for our application um and and inside of embedded in our application suddenly the ability to share that information to be able to disseminate it uh cleanly throughout the organization so that you know you can open up an untap unrealized business really becomes much harder and now you're at the whim of that application team to you know build that into their bespoke application components which really then ties you to their uh, you know, you, you get tied into their uh, life application lifecycle process instead of having the right. integration component you know decoupled so we can you know make modifications um, you know without impacting the real business process that we we're trying to establish in the first place. At a modular level or service level, yeah. you want to be able to make the changes and not have it have a ripple impact like you were talking about earlier. So, absolutely. Yes, so that's not to be responsible for all the apps out there, right? <laughs> we, your app can do your thing, and the other apps can do their things. And, yeah. I think we have three minutes left, or three to five minutes left. So, Daniel, I'm not sure if you had any other slides that you want to take us through um, from a cloud yeah, pack perspective. Yeah, I'll, I'll throw this up um, just just you know, really quick while I'm, I'm you know, talking through some you know some other stuff. I mean, and again, we can provide these slides. Um, we. And I throw this up because you know agile integration and IBM integration, we really do see it as two sides of the same coin. Um, you know, it's, it's two areas that really need to be working in tandem um, to really you know gain the most benefit of what you're doing. You know, we can you know, and and you know, the, part of the benefit with IBM because we've been in the integration space so long, it's you know we can take you know the you know your current applications that are sitting you know in you know in the legacy. Let's you know, say it's on-prem bare metal style legacy, have integrations that are uh, best suited to sit with those applications because so, you know we do want the integration sitting close to the application. And that's you know the you know you know, you, you know the more hops you put in, you know the, especially the further away right. you get, you know the you know the you get problems with that. So, but at the same time, we can take that same integration technology, you know the, you know let's just say App Connect Enterprise, the same bar files, the same tech, you know, digital assets that you've spent time investing and creating, and deploy them in a microservices uh, App Connect Enterprise you know container that's running lightweight right upside with your application and not just provide the container but provide all of you know the you know with the clapback for integration all the metering the monitoring this the uh security around that container providing um you know all the you know day two um operational aspects through the use of you know operators that we're continually enhancing uh, beyond just kind of the helm truck style deployment so you know there's there's a lot of benefits that we can be talking about you know, just just by adopting you know this platformized approach. So one thing uh, again, I one thing to add to that, one thing to add to that thought real quick, and I don't think I said it earlier. I know I said it in the application session with Sean. The um the 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 software licenses that we're talking about, or the software components or services, they run on top of OpenShift. So Daniel just yeah. said it. They're all containerized basically. Yeah. So again, opens everything up. You don't lose any of the features that you've had in the past. It only opens up the integration capabilities from from yeah. that perspective so yeah. just to and and, and we yeah and we believe so much in you know the openshift model that that you know so cloud pack for integration comes with entitlement for openshift so you don't have to buy openshift separately to use cloud pack for integration now you are going to have 
you know, bespoke applications or, you know, data warehouses or things that are going to leverage either, you know, Cloudpack for data or Cloudpack for application or just OpenShift native licensing. Um, but right. you don't have to, you don't have to kind of you know, double pay for that OpenShift licensing when you want to leverage Cloudpack for integration because we, you know, right. it's, it's a foundational piece. It, it's, you know, so critical uh, that we're going to, you know, bring it with us as, as part of the journey. It's the cloud operating system. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Kelly. Daniel, thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it.